Hi there, and welcome to the Mind Coaching Podcast. I'm Frank Nielsen. I work as a mental trainer. And in today's episode, I wanted to find out more about vitamin D. I know that vitamin D is important. I've always been curious how much do I need to be in the sun? How much do I need to supplement? And is it possible to take too much vitamin D? So I decided to find the best expert out there. And his name is Michael Hollick. He's a professor of medicine at the Boston University Medical Center. And he's also the editor-in-chief of the journal Clinical Laboratory. He has made discoveries in the field of vitamin D that has led to novel therapies for metabolic bone diseases, hypoglycemic disorders, and psoriasis. He's the author of more than 400 publications about biochemistry, physiology, metabolism, and photobiology of vitamin D, and the photopath pathophysiology of vitamin D e deficiency. I have to uh, have to pardon that word. <laughs> I'm not the expert. Uh, Michael is. He is also the author of the book Vitamin D Solution. He has been involved in he has also been involved in a credible app that I use every day after I found out I found out about it. It's uh, called D Minder and it uses a GPS and a light sensors. So I have always been curious uh, when, how much vitamin D do I need? And in the, when I use this app, I use the GPS and the light sensor on my phone. By using that, it tells me how much I need to be in the sun. And it also gave me an alarm when I finished. So it's perfect. To the episode. In today's episode, we talk about the following. What is vitamin D? Is it possible to reduce the risk of the flu by as much as 42%? That is extremely interesting. Vitamin D controls over 200 genes in the cardiovascular system. Reduce the risk of heart attack by 50% and get 100% more likely to survive a heart attack. Lack of vitamin D causes higher blood pressure. How much vitamin D your body needs every single day? Is it possible to take too much? What are the symptoms of too little vitamin D? Are you born in the winter? You have a higher risk of schizophrenia later in life. How much vitamin D should small children have every day? And lots, lots, lots more. I really enjoyed this talk with uh, Michael Hollick, and I hope you like it as well. If you haven't listened to this uh, to uh, my episodes before, my English isn't always the, be- always the best, but I hope you understand Michael. He's uh, talking the most, so enjoy this episode with Michael Hollick. Today I want to welcome Professor Michael Hollick. Pro- welcome, Professor. It's a pleasure to be here. Right and early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, five o'clock for you, Michael. <laughs> uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to this conversation because uh, I think that, especially in Norway, we do not understand the the seriousness of uh, getting our vitamin D. Uh, and uh, in our winter, we don't have that much sun, as you know, and a lot of people are lacking of energy. So and uh, we do not understand that uh, that is a lot of the lack of sun and vitamin D. But before we start with that one, Michael, uh, can you please uh, explain your discovery as your graduate student and uh, why vitamin D is so important? Sure. So, I mean, I started out uh, as a graduate student at University of Wisconsin back in 1969, looking for an area of investigation. And just like anybody else, you always want to work in the hottest areas possible. And back then, before DNA was even discovered, everybody was interested in understanding how does the body utilize energy, mitochondrial oxidation. So that was what I wanted to do. And so I went to um, the Enzyme Institute at the University of Wisconsin and asked if they had an opening. And of course, they didn't because they had lots of postdoctoral fellows. They didn't need a naive graduate student. So they sent me over to this guy, DeLuca, and they said, he was telling me about vitamin D. And I said, why would I want to work in vitamin D? And they said, probably that's the only thing you're going to work in because that's the only thing that's available. And I thought, oh, my God. I mean, what am I going to do in vitamin D? And it turned out to be a golden purse, basically, taking a sow's ear into a golden purse. So back then, everybody thought vitamin D just worked, but it took 24 hours to work. And then they began to realize that maybe actually has to get activated. And so it had been shown that pigs, given huge amounts of vitamin D, could make 25-hydroxy-D. But nobody really knew whether or not humans could do that. 
And so I was the first for my master's degree to identify 25-hydroxy vitamin D as the major circulating form. And then the interest was, it looked like it was active, but it took a long time to work. And so maybe it actually needed further activation. And so as my PhD, I was the one to first structurally identify the active form of vitamin D. And then my roommate and I, because I'm an organic chemist, were the first to chemically make it. And then we were the first to give it to people who had kidney problems okay. because we began to realize that the kidneys activate vitamin D. And nobody ever understood back then why was it that patients with kidney failure didn't respond to vitamin D. And now the light was turned on. And so once we made the active form of vitamin D and gave it to kidney patients that had kidney failure, that had severe bone disease, that were wheelchair bound, had really severe bone achingness, all of those symptoms resolved. So that was my introduction into translational <laughs> medicine wow. and vitamin D. So we can actually thank you as a graduate student that you are taking vitamin D uh, as the, at the doctor when taking tests these days. So then, of course, after the active form was identified, then then it was the thought process was you should probably have clinical utility. And so I participated in the first uh, development of the assay for 25-hydroxy vitamin D with Dr. Uh, Richard Belsey at Massachusetts General Hospital. And, um, and so then that was introduced and others had – designed um, similar assays. So everybody right now, if you want to measure your vitamin D status, you measure 25-hydroxy mm. vitamin D. And then for those that had alterations in how they utilize vitamin D, special cases like sarcoid, tuberculosis, um, hyperparathyroidism, then you can measure the active form of vitamin D. So that then gives you a good insight into all of the functions of vitamin D. Uh, what I'm curious about is uh, what is actually vitamin D, uh, Professor? Right. So active vitamin D means that 25-hydroxy vitamin D is made in your liver. It's the major circulating form. And then it goes to your kidneys where it gets activated. But that activation is only to regulate the calcium and bone metabolism. So the active form of vitamin D goes to your intestine, increases intestinal calcium absorption. And it goes to the bone to mobilize actually calcium out of the skeleton because the function of vitamin D is to maintain your blood calcium. Mm -hmm. Why? Because your blood calcium controls all metabolic functions, neuromuscular activity. So your body cares about your calcium. And so if you're getting enough from your diet, now you can start putting it into your bones. But separately, we now realize that every tissue and cell in your body basically has a vitamin D receptor. Wow. And it's good evidence that some of your immune cells, like your macrophages, they activate vitamin D locally. And we and others had shown back in the 90s that your colon, prostate, breast, and now even brain, most tissues in your body can activate vitamin D locally. And that's a whole new concept. So what we realize now is that if you can maintain adequate 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels, you now have enough substrate to go to the macrophage to get activated. And in the macrophage, for example, when it gets activated, it then tells the macrophage to make a protein that kills infectious agents called cathalocytin. And so we're now beginning to understand more about all of the health benefits of vitamin D. The thinking is that you activate vitamin D locally, say, in your colon to regulate colon cell growth, to reduce risk of colon cancer. And then what the body cleverly does is that it induces its own destruction right in that cell. So it never enters the bloodstream. So only your kidneys activate vitamin D, put it into your bloodstream, to have effects on calcium and bone metabolism. But locally, it's what we call an autocrine effect or paracrine effect, is that the cell will make it, use it, and destroy it so that it never gets back into the circulation to have a negative effect on your calcium. Because otherwise, if you started making it in all your cells and put it in your bloodstream, your calcium would go really high. Mm. Interesting. Uh 
But you also say calcium, so isn't it important to supplement with calcium, or do we get enough calcium in our food, or it sounds like calcium is the important part here. There's no question that calcium is important. Mm -hmm. And so the recommendation from the Institute of Medicine is that teenagers, for example, should be on about 1,300 milligrams a day. Dietary source is by far your best as opposed to supplement. Mm -hmm. Um, So dairy, for example, is a really great source. For adults, the recommendation is 1,000 milligrams a day, again, from dietary sources. And for those over um, 70, probably 1,200 milligrams a day, just to be on the safe side. Mm. And so dairy, for example, eight ounces of milk contains 300 milligrams of calcium. And I personally drink three glasses skim milk every day to get my calcium supplement. And there continues to be good evidence that the dairy provides whey protein, which is a great source of protein, mm. and especially for growing children and for such for older adults, that protein is very important for them. Mm. And then there's this concept of alkalinization of the body. Are you familiar with this? Where animal protein, when you're eating it, you acidify your body. Yes. But if you have a protein, if you have a vegetable diet, mm. a vegetarian diet, you alkalinize the body. But it turns out that milk will do the same thing. Okay. So I have all of my patients, my osteoporotic patients, even my healthy patients, all on adequate vitamin D and adequate calcium intake. The two go together. Wow. Uh, because it's a lot about, uh, I'm not going to go deep into this one, but it's a lot about milk or and diary. And uh, when, you're, when you're listening to diet, diet, diet experts these days, and uh, that milk isn't often the good thing to to drink, but from from what I can understand, uh, milk is a great thing. Yeah, I, I guess everybody has their own opinion, mm. but there's a lot of new research now mm. uh, in the area of dairy, and it was just a paper just came out recently in the Journal of Nutrition showing specifically that calcium from dairy mm. is better for bone health, especially for um, older uh, people. And there's a nice study done in teenage girls showing taking a calcium supplement to get their calcium versus getting it from dairy, Mm. dairy was better. Wow. And there continues to be suggestion Mm. that especially if you take oral calcium supplements, maybe increases risk for cardiovascular disease, right? Okay. Calcification of your blood vessels. Mm. There's no evidence that that happens with dietary intake of calcium. Okay. So drinking milk from now on. <laughs> but what kind of diseases? Yes, I drink three glasses every day. Interesting. Uh, and you're still healthy for what I can see. And you're up, up early. Uh, but what kind of diseases do we see because of low levels of vitamin D? Right. So, and then we'll talk about how much vitamin D you need to do that. Right. And so there's a lot of association studies um, looking at sun exposure. So for example, if you live in Norway, you have a 10 to 15 times higher risk of getting type 1 diabetes than if you're born and live at the equator. If you live above Atlanta, Georgia for the first 10 years of your life, you have a 100% increased risk of getting multiple sclerosis for the rest of your life. There's good evidence that in the summertime, there's less cardiovascular mortality Um, So there's a lot of association with sun exposure and health benefits. In addition, right, sunlight makes vitamin D. Mm. And there are a lot of studies to suggest that improving your vitamin D status can reduce risk of colorectal cancer, breast cancer by about 50%. Um, Some studies have shown, for example, in school children that were taking 1,200 units of vitamin D a day during the wintertime, reduced risk of influenza A infection by 42%. <laughs> Another study out of Yale, out of New Haven, showed adults that maintain a blood level of around 40 nanograms per ml, 100 nanomoles per liter. To get there, you would need to be on three to 4,000 units of vitamin D a day. Reduced risk of upper respiratory tract infections by almost 50%. There are other studies to show that depression, neurocognitive dysfunction are associated with vitamin D deficiency. A study from the National Health Survey showed that those adults that had the highest intake of calcium and vitamin D reduced risk of type 2 diabetes by 33%. Right? Framingham Heart Study showed if you're vitamin D deficient, 50% higher risk of having a heart attack. 
And a separate study showed that if you have a heart attack and you're vitamin D deficient, you have a 100% increased risk of dying of that heart no. attack. No. No. So you're serious? Wow. For serious. Yep. And so there's a lot of evidence to suggest that vitamin D is very important for overall health and, and well-being. So improves your immune function, reduces risk for autoimmune diseases, improves cardiovascular status because your blood vessels have a vitamin D receptor mm. and it causes vasorelaxation. We did a study in black teenagers in Georgia and they were all vitamin D deficient. And when we gave them 2,000 units of vitamin D a day for just three months, we could show vascular relaxation and improve blood flow, right? And so there is evidence out there that vitamin D, improving your vitamin D status definitely can have very important health benefits. Uh, but why are we, are we so afraid of getting too much vitamin D uh, from supplementation? Right. And so it turns out that this is a historical problem. What people don't realize, if you go back to the literature, that before 1950, even in Europe, f- most foods, many foods were fortified with vitamin D. So for in England, for example, custard, milk, right, um, soap, even shaving cream, soap? Many, <laughs> not everything was being fortified with vitamin D. And then around 1950, there was an outbreak of infants that had high blood calcium, had um, what looked like birth defects, funny face, right? And they had mild mental retardation. And so they brought in the experts because they couldn't figure out why this was happening. And the experts looked in the literature and found that if you give pregnant rats high doses of vitamin D, that they have pups that have funny looking faces They have high blood calcium, but they couldn't figure out if they had mild mental retardation, okay? And so they concluded without any evidence whatsoever that it must be that the milk, which was not very tightly controlled, was being overfortified with vitamin D and that this was causing the toxicity. So instantly in Great Britain, they passed laws forbidding anything from being fortified with vitamin D. And that concepts spread throughout all of Europe and Asia, South America. It's only the United States and Canada that still maintain vitamin D supplementation because this started back in the 1930s when they began to realize that rickets, which was like 90% of the population throughout most of Europe and northern United States had rickets. And when they finally put vitamin D in milk, it basically eradicated that problem as a health issue. Right. And so guess what? The rest of the story, it turns out that those infants likely had what's called Williams syndrome. It's a rare genetic disorder that causes elfin faces, so funny looking faces, mild mental retardation, and curiously, they have a hypersensitivity to vitamin D (laughs) and they will become hypercalcemic. And so even though I, I had been to Great Britain and had talk to um, some of the legislative bodies to, in, in the health area about this. This was about maybe now a decade ago, trying to convince them to reverse these rules and laws. They haven't done it. And so vitamin D continues in the psyche of, of both the, the legislative body and the healthcare professionals in government, as well as doctors and healthcare professionals in general have been taught vitamin D is one of the most toxic fat soluble vitamins. It turns out not true. That is probably one of the least uh, toxic vitamins. And um, so now in Finland, as you probably know, in Sweden is now for- permitting fortification of milk. Some milk in France is being fortified with vitamin D, mm. but still most countries forbid mm. the fortification of food with vitamin D. Uh, and uh, when I look at uh, the supplementation here in Norway, I think it's recommended, uh, is it 400 international units as a daily dosage? I think that's maximum. I think. Right. And that's what they did in the United States. So that's what we've had forever mm. is 400 units in a quart of milk, right? So one serving eight ounces um, was 100 units. Recently, the FDA is now permitted to double it. 
So how much do we need then, doctor? Pardon? How much do we need as a daily dosage of vitamin D? So the Institute of Medicine recommends for infants 400 units a day, especially breastfed infants, because there's essentially no vitamin D in human breast milk. They recommend 600 international units for children and adults and 800 units for adults over the age of 70 years. The Endocrine Society uh, practice guidelines, and I chair that committee. Uh, there's over 18,000 doctors you know, in, in, this, uh, in this organization around the world. And when we looked at all the literature, we had all many experts in vitamin D on this committee. We recommend infants, 400 up to 1,000 units is perfectly fine. Children, 600 to 1,000 units. And adults, 1,500 to 2,000 units a day. And more importantly, if you're obese, you need two to three times more vitamin D to satisfy your requirement because vitamin D is fat soluble. And so it gets diluted in your body fat and is not available to the body for mm. utilization. And I think that is something we are scared about because we heard that vitamin D is, uh, is uh, saved in our, in our fat. So uh, I think we're scared of that we are getting too much vitamin D because it's stored in our fat. So that is, that is. So again, this is historical. Mm. And so if you go back into the 1940s, vitamin D was thought to be this miracle um, drug. So they were giving hundreds of thousands of units a day to patients with rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Right? It did have some benefit, but then they became toxic. Mm. And then they remained toxic for years. So again, it's in the psyche of the health healthcare professionals mm. that if you become vitamin D toxic, mm. you're in deep trouble for years. Mm. However, not true. So we reported on a study of a um, gentleman from Florida and he, back in the 1990s, when I was already publishing data suggesting that you could reduce risk of prostate cancer by improving your vitamin D status, he went to his local pharmacy. It was not available. Vitamin D supplements were not available in the United States because nobody cared about vitamin D. So he went on the internet and he bought a product. And the product said one teaspoon had a thousand units of vitamin D. So he took two teaspoons a day for a year and he became severely toxic. His, his blood level was over 500 nanograms per ml, right? So over like 1,200 uh, yeah, nanomoles per liter. And his calcium was very high. And so um, he had called me. We did an analysis of the product. We found that the product, they forgot to dilute it. He was taking a million units a day <laughs> a year, right? And so he called me up and he asked me to be his doctor. I told him, look, no sun exposure without sun protection, no vitamin D, no calcium. And we published him in the New England Journal of Medicine, and we showed his 25 hydroxy vitamin D level gradually came down after a couple of years. He had no problem, no sequelae from the vitamin D toxicity. His calcium came down within two months. He was perfectly fine. And that's around a million international units a day. Right. So that's the kind of levels. I mean, there's a study done that I participated in. Uh, in Calgary, Canada, there's a Pure North group. They've been following people taking vitamin D. Some of the Calgarians are taking up to 20,000 units of vitamin D a day. Their blood level is somewhere around 150 nanomoles per liter, about 60 nanograms per ml. No toxicity after a couple of years of, um, on that amount. We did a study because I treat all of my patients with an equivalent of, of three thousand three hundred units a day because I get fifty thousand units twice a month okay. and we published the study for six years and showed that they were all perfectly fine no toxicity and what is what is the positive side when they're taking those dosages that you're giving your patients so the we have in the United States a pharmaceutical it's vitamin d2 and the reason it's vitamin D2 is only because it predates the FDA. Nobody ever got the approval for vitamin D3. So vitamin D3 is a supplement at 50,000 units, but not as a pharmaceutical. Okay. So I use the pharmaceutical, and because it's a prescription, 
The pharmacy will call the patient every month to pick the prescription up. So they're more serious about taking their medication. Mm. But for those patients that just want to do it on their own, mm. I tell them 3,000 to 4,000 units a day. I personally take 4,000 units every day. And my level is around uh, 150 nanomoles per liter, about 60 nanograms per ml. Uh, but let's say we are deficient. How long time do we need to get our to up to optimal levels? Right. So we've done those studies as well, and others have also. And so when it's curious about vitamin D is that you would think that if you're on, say, 4,000 units a day, that your level is going to gradually go up and someday become toxic. Right? Not true. It turns out that if you take 100 units of vitamin D, you raise your blood level by about one nanogram per ml, 2.5 nanomoles per liter, and just stays there. If you go on 1,000, you will increase it by about um, 10 nanograms per ml, or 25 nanomoles per liter, and it stays there. It doesn't continue to rise. And so when I put my patients on 3,000 unit equivalent a day, that 50,000 every two weeks, their level goes up to around 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. So about 100 to 125 nanomoles per liter. It just stays there. After six years, we've shown, it still stays there. And it only takes about eight weeks for you to achieve that. But if you're uh, sun exposed, uh, sh- if you're sun exposed, if you're in, out in the sun, uh, should we uh, keep taking the supplements or stop t- uh, taking supplements when we're exposed to the sun? Right. And so I love to play tennis and I um, also garden and I like to cycle sunscreen on my face, but not on my arms and legs. And I still take 4,000 units every okay. day. Okay. We did a study and showed that um, when we looked at 3.8 million samples, blood samples, measured in the United States. Yeah, exactly. So there's no question about the number, right? (laughs) 3.8 samples, right? And we looked at Southern United States, Middle and Northern United States. And the blood levels were really interesting. It turns out that they only increase by about eight to 10 nanograms per ml. And as a result, um, it fluctuates a little bit. Hmm. A very nice study was actually done uh, in Scandinavian countries as well. And they showed also that um, you raise your blood level to around 75 to 80 nanomoles per liter in the summertime. So taking vitamin D all the time helps to maintain your blood level hmm. at a very good level. And the question, of course, is how do you know how much sun? Because time of day, season, latitude, degree of skin pigmentation. So there's only one thing to do, right? Develop an app. And so we've done that, right? Working with the uh, Ontometrics. It's called dminder.info. So D-M-I-N-D-E-R dot I-N-F-O. It'll tell you anywhere on this planet, any time of the day, how much vitamin D you make. And it warns you to get out of the sun so that you don't get it. On. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it's free on your iPhone and iPad, on your iPhone and your Android. I'm going for sure going to use that one. Uh, but can we get uh, enough amount of vitamin D from the, our food? A lot of people think that. Is that possible? Right. That's the problem. So everybody thinks if you have a healthy diet, which is what everybody is now promoting these days, that you're getting all the nutrients. Well, guess what? What contains vitamin D? Wild caught salmon. We found farm salmon, at least in the United States, have only about 10 to 25% of the vitamin D content. So wild caught salmon, how much is there? In a serving of 3.5 ounces, 500 to 1,000 units, right? I'm telling you, you should be on 3,000 to 4,000 units a day. Mm. Mushrooms exposed to sunlight. Cod liver oil. That's it. That's it? That's it. And that's your problem. Okay? So if you're in the United States, you can get some from milk. But there's only 100 units, right? And I'm telling you, even children should be on 600 to 1,000 units a day. Mm. You can't be drinking 6 to 10 glasses of milk a day, Mm. right, in the United States. And so if you're not getting adequate sun, 
And essentially nobody does hmm. because we also showed even if you live at the equator or if you're living in Norway where the sun shines all uh, summer long, right? 24 hours a day almost. <laughs> right? uh, in you the North only take vitamin D from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. That's it? That's it. Okay, because that's to do with the zenith angle of the sun. And that's why in the wintertime, for example, if you live in the United States above Atlanta, Georgia, you make essentially nothing from November until around March, April. And where you live in Norway, because we've done a study there, six months of the year, even with the sun shining, doesn't matter. You make no vitamin D. So you're not making any vitamin D from some around mid-September until around mid-April. <laughs> so without supplementation, you have uh, low levels of vitamin D for sure. Right. And that's the problem. And as you know, there was a very nice study done by um, Dr. Moen uh, a couple of years ago showing that those living in northern Norway had much better levels than those living in southern Norway. Mm. Right. And the reason is because they were eating oily fish. Interesting. Very interesting. But are there any studies into uh, vitamin D and the mental performance? In what performance? Uh, mental performance, also our mind. So yeah. So I mean, there there's a very nice study out of Australia showing that there was about a thirty one percent or so um, reduction in neurocognitive function if you were vitamin D deficient. So that neurocognitive function seems to be associated. Also, Alzheimer's disease has been associated with vitamin D deficiency. Okay. And also, depression has been associated with vitamin D deficiency. Especially depression, I think. But what's also interesting is that a very nice study by McGrath in Australia showed that if you give pregnant rats a vitamin D deficient diet, their pups have bigger brains. Why? Because they have more white matter than gray matter. And they, are, and they are neurologically less functional. And there is mounting evidence, especially in, in Scandinavian countries, but also even in Australia in the wintertime. If you're born at the end of the winter, you're more likely to develop schizophrenia later in life. No, 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 no. <laughs> is it? <laughs> why, is, why is that, uh, Professor? Well, like I said, we think in utero mm. that vitamin D is playing a very important function in your brain mm. and, and maybe on your immune system. And so those pregnant rat studies may be giving us an insight into that. That's scary for sure. But I, as I've seen your YouTube uh, lecture and you talk about uh, how vitamin D can uh, uh, provide some effect against cesarean section. Right. So because vitamin D is critically important for proximal muscle function. And muscle function is very important for the birthing process. So we did a study in over 200 women at our hospital and simply looked at those that required a C-section versus not and related it to their vitamin D status. The higher their vitamin D status, lower was their risk for requiring a cesarean section. And the most serious complication of pregnancy, of course, is preeclampsia. And we went on to show with Lisa Bodner in Pittsburgh that the higher your vitamin D status, lower is your risk for developing preeclampsia. Interesting. Do we know how much? Pardon? Do we know uh, by how much? How much so, it is? so it the some somewhere around um, about two to three hundred percent reduced risk. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty amount. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can vitamin D have any impact on, on our cholesterol levels? No. In my opinion, no. Okay. And uh, we did a study some time ago showing that oral vitamin D or, or being exposed to simulated sunlight did not have a, an effect. Because people think that the precursor of vitamin D, 70 hydrocholesterol, is used by the body. And so therefore may lower your blood cholesterol levels. Not true. And the reason is that you only make it in your skin. The blood cholesterol levels have no influence on your skin's ability to make vitamin D. So in my opinion, there's little evidence that it influences blood cholesterol levels. It does influence cardiovascular status in various ways, but not blood cholesterol levels. Uh -huh. so for example, 
Right. So, for example, do you know what foam cells are? Foam cells nope. in blood vessels. So these are cells that basically are kind of ingesting um, cholesterol and fat, and they're deposited atherosclerotic plaques in your blood vessels. And they show that the active form of vitamin D inhibits that process. Okay. So then it can, uh, in some way, uh, do something about, about our cholesterol levels because of that uh, function. So that's right. And so people, you know, it, it depends on the kind of cholesterol that you have, of course, in your bloodstream as well, mm. right? So just your blood cholesterol level doesn't mean risk for heart disease. It mm. depends upon the type of cholesterol. Mm. And, uh, and, and so what vitamin D does is that it regulates, they estimate, up to 200 genes in your cardiovascular system. So it, it has effects on causing your heart to have better function. Um, and like I said, it will cause vasorelaxation of your blood mm. vessels. So it reduces blood pressure, mm. right? Because it controls renin, which is a blood pressure regulator produced by your kidneys. Um, so there's a whole variety of mechanisms by which we believe that vitamin D plays a role in reducing risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke. Uh, does it have any f- effect on high, cor- uh, high um, the stress hormone uh, cortisol? No, not that I'm aware of, but there is curious evidence that sunlight will alter the gene that makes adrenocorticotropin hormone, ACTH, that potentially increase your, your blood cholesterol levels, and that may be having some effect on your immune system. Okay. Now, how that works exactly, I don't think we fully understand, mm. but probably not through vitamin D. I'm curious about one thing, doctor, because from my own experience, I got a sunstroke or something a couple of years ago. I was I was uh, too much exposed to the sun, and I'm uh, I got the dizzy, and uh, my brain function started to become blurry. And uh, after that uh, episode, I now experienced that I'm getting foggy, I'm getting uh, a lack of uh, uh, brain function when I'm too much in the sun. Uh, do you know anything about that? Well. I mean, if you if you get too much sunlight mm. and you get heated up, I mean, you could wind up with, you know, the toxic effects of, of that that type of sun exposure. I mean, um, you can wind up with heat exhaustion, for example, that can sometimes cause this. Mm. But we do know that beta endorphin is made in your skin. That's why people feel better probably when they're exposed to sunlight. Mm. You make nitric oxide and release nitric oxide in your skin. It causes vasodilation. So sometimes it can it may make you feel woozy if your blood vessels really dilate a lot. Ah. So there there may be some additional explanation for mm. that. So yeah. ah, so that's the reason when you're too uh, long in uh, exposed to the sun on your right, and that's because nitric oxide, mm. which is a, a major factor that causes vasorelaxation, mm. that's the reason why your skin turns red. For example, because your blood vessels are dilating. Right? Ah. Oh, I'm learning a lot today. This is fun. <laughs> but what do you think about the sunscreen then, uh, doctor? So I think the, the early sunscreens, I think, were probably horrible because they mainly only blocked that UVB because back then they thought it was only UVB, the high energy radiation that was causing skin cancer. And therefore, people were getting blasted with UVA radiation. So it turns out that UVB radiation only gets into your epidermis and hardly into your dermis because all your protein and DNA are absorbing that radiation. UVA penetrates deep into your skin and affects your immune system, can destroy the collagen in your dermis, increasing risk for wrinkling and increasing risk for cancer. So back then, they were really harming themselves. The broad spectrum um, sunscreens are better because they do protect you and reduces risk for sunburn. That's the key. You never want to get a sunburn. Mm. Um, and so if you're going to be out for a long time, it's wise to use broad spectrum sunscreen. Mm. But the problem, I think, is that these sunscreens have chemicals and these chemicals applied to your skin get absorbed into your bloodstream. Mm. And long term, we really don't know what, what their effects are. So my recommendation has always been clothing is probably better when you can, right? Broad rim hat, always protect your face um, and get some sensible sun exposure and use the app. 
mm. right? Take advantage of the beneficial effect, prevent the damaging effects from excessive exposure. Mm. Uh, do we produce vitamin D when we use uh, sunblock, for example? So SPF of 30, if you use it properly, reduces your ability to make vitamin D in your skin by 97.5%. Right. <laughs> you saw my face at this moment. <laughs> yeah. That's when you use it properly. Most people don't use sunblock properly. And so a study that was done in Australia where they simply gave us the sunscreen to people and said, put it on and we'll get your vitamin D level. They didn't see that much difference, but that's because people weren't using it properly. Hmm. But if you use it properly, because we've done the studies, it makes sense, right? SPF of 30 absorbs 97.5% UVB radiation. So therefore, you reduce your ability to make vitamin D by that amount. Mm. Uh, I'm I'm curious about the, a lot of things, but what what is the most important you think about vitamin D? I well, I think that our hunter gatherer forefathers were outside every day making vitamin D. A very nice study in Africa because that tells us from an evolution perspective how much vitamin D we need. Their blood levels in Maasai herders are around 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. So 100 to 125 nanomoles per liter, right? To get there, you need to be on 3,000 to 4,000 units of vitamin D a day, right? And we showed years ago that if you're in a bathing suit and you go outside into the sun, out on a beach, and you get a light pinkness to your skin 24 hours later, it's called a minimal erythemal dose, it's equivalent to ingesting 15,000 to 20,000 units of vitamin D. So your skin has a huge capacity to make vitamin D. Mm. But now with our habits of being indoors, working all the time, you only make vitamin D from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m., right? Kids are in school, mm. you're at work, people are becoming obese, vitamin D deficiency is becoming a major health issue. It's a global health problem. And so in my opinion, Everybody should either be taking vitamin D supplementation, getting a little bit of sensible sun exposure in the summertime when they can, right? And um, and, and that definitely can improve your health. Uh, how should we take the supplement then? Is it, uh, do they get rid of food or? Right, so that's always the question. And so there are studies out there to suggest that maybe you have to take a little food with that. Not true at least from our experience, because we did a study in orange juice. You would think orange juice doesn't have any fat, right? Why would it be? And so you can micronize it and put it in orange juice. We did the seminal study that finally the FDA took uh, and permitted then some juice manufacturers to put vitamin D in orange juice, right? So it's bioavailable. You can take it on a full stomach, empty stomach, with fat, without fat. In my opinion, does not make any difference, right? But take a good brand, national brand, mm. and be careful on the internet. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of people experience lack of energy in the winter. What uh, Do we know the reason that we feel this lack of energy when we are low on vitamin D? So there's a whole bunch of reasons. The first is, of course, you can have seasonal affective disorder, where the, the light um, from the sun is not suppressing your melatonin levels, right? And so the intensity and duration of sunlight that suppresses your melatonin levels makes you feel great when you get up in the morning. But a lot of people, about 40% of the population, they cannot regulate their melatonin levels with winter sunlight. So as a result, they want to hibernate all winter. So they feel depressed, mm. okay? But separately, if you're vitamin D deficient, Right, you have aches and pains in your bones and muscles, or you feel that your joints are a little bit more um, stiff in the morning. Those are classic signs for vitamin D deficiency osteomalacia. Muscle function is definitely associated with vitamin D status. And so people in the wintertime, they just feel lazier and they don't feel as functional. They feel like couch potatoes. <laughs> Again, vitamin D will help improve muscle function. Mm. It improves mood, mm. as it reduces risk for depression, right? Because it does, there's some animal studies that show it increases serotonin levels in your brain, right? And of course, that's how these uh, antidepressives work. So there's a whole variety of reasons why 
we recommend that you should take vitamin D year round, mm. but especially in the wintertime, mm. because you're definitely going to become vitamin D deficient. I, I think we got it all in our professor, if it's something I haven't forgotten that you, uh, you think you, we should share. Well, the only th- suggestions are, there was a very nice study done in pregnant women by Bruce Hollis and Carol Wagner in South Carolina. Pregnant women can take 4,000 units of vitamin D a day, and they raise their blood level to around 100 nanomoles per liter. We think that's ideal because that's exactly where Maasai herders are, okay? My level is around that level because I have everybody on 3,000 to 4,000 units a day adults. Mm. We also know toxicity-wise that the Endocrine Society said adults could take up to 10,000 units a day and not worry about toxicity. Mm. Children up to 4,000 units a day and not worry about toxicity, mm. right? So I recommend to make it simple. Mm. Infants should be getting at least 400 up to 1,000 units a day. Children should get, in my opinion, 1,000 units a day. Teenagers should be like adults. They should be on two to 4,000 units a day. Mm. And if you are obese, right, BMI of greater than 30, you need two to three times more to satisfy that requirement. And take advantage of the sun, because not only does it give you your vitamin D, it improves your mood, makes beta endorphin, nitric oxide, and the list goes on. I wrote a recent review on the subject, right? And so sensible sun exposure, use that app, Hmm. dminder.info, so d-m-i-n-d-e-r.info, is a great way to take advantage of the beneficial effect and vent the damaging effects from excessive exposure. Hmm. And one last comment. And that is that everybody says, worry about skin cancer, right? But what people don't realize is that most skin cancers are non-melanoma, easy to detect and easy to treat, right? Melanoma, the most deadly form, they occur on the least sun exposed areas and occupational sun exposure decreases your risk for melanoma. Have a delightful day. Thank you so much for the information, doctor. Have a good day. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Michael as much as I did. If you liked it, please give it a five-star review on iTunes. And if this was something you want to share with others, you can find uh, the episode on uh, YouTube, on the Mental Trainer podcast. Uh, so you can share it from YouTube. You can also find it on Facebook at MT Frank Nielsen. He's a Norwegian, but uh, I think that other people can also understand uh, the episodes. He's in English. And I see that a lot of my listeners are in Australia. If you're Australian, please give me a uh, clue to who I can talk to that uh, is an interesting Australian. I've always been curious about Australia, but uh, I do not know any any uh, interesting Australians. And I really want to talk to one. So please send me a suggestion. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, where I post uh, quotes and nice pictures uh, and so on. That is mental trainer Frank Nielsen. So thank you so much for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it and have a nice day.